Shabbat Shalom. Today's message is Parashat Vayera, and I entitled it, Can We Turn Hate to Love? You know, when I was in high school, what I loved most about algebra and geometry were the formulas. I kept a record of every new formula, and it became like a game to me where I can plug in the specifications to find the correct answer. Believe it or not, that's how I see the Torah. Our rabbi taught us that it's not a religious book. Rather, it's a book filled with morals and principles that can be applied to any situation in our lives. They would help us to deal with them. Some of them can be taken literally, and others are simply allegories. Their value is in showing us how our ancestors, beginning with Adam and Eve, how they handle their dilemmas. We can choose to learn from their mistakes or not. This way we can learn not to repeat them. That's how we become wise. When we read these stories, it's important to think about the period in which they were written and to whom they were addressed. Now, although the customs of that day have changed, their principles remain timeless. For example, here in Vaera, in Genesis 18, 19, here's what our Boreolam, our creator, said about Abram. For I have known him so that he will command his children and his household after him to keep the way of yud vav Adonai, to do what is tzedek, umishpat, righteous and just, so that the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he promised him. Wow. For me, this is a basic formula that can solve every ailment that plagues this planet. So let's break it down. It begins with, for I have known him, ki yada'ativ. The word yada'ativ comes from the root yodea. In Hebrew, it means intimacy. I, Abraham was intimately known by God. He was chosen for a reason. Was he chosen because of his great faith? I don't think so, because... We read twice that Abraham told Sarah to lie, saying that he was her brother. The principle here, we're not chosen because we are perfect. Noah was chosen. The people of Israel were and still are chosen. You and I are chosen. Is it easy to be chosen? Absolutely not. Most of us prefer to be left alone. To live as we please, we say, choose somebody else. But the people of Israel, we do not have that option because we didn't choose ourselves. This is not a matter of pride. It's far from that. It entails a responsibility greater than most of us are willing to bear, which is why we run away. When I hear people saying, I'm proud to be a Jew, I really wonder what it means to them. How can we be proud of something we didn't choose? And in fact, our forefathers were very humble. Moshe was so humble, he didn't want to take the role. It was Pharaoh whose pride broke him and destroyed his nation. Now let's continue to the next step for Abraham in this verse. He will command or instruct his children and his household after him, which could also mean posterity, posterity, the future generations, to keep derech Adonai, the way of the Lord. How? By doing righteousness and justice. La asot tzedek u mishpat. Then I wondered, what could Abraham have known then about doing righteousness and justice? The Torah was written down much later, and he was surrounded by people who were neither righteous nor just. We see this in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, where Lot chose to live. However, from the first chapter of Bereshit, 
we are given the understanding that God breathed his Ruach. He placed his divine spark within us, within mankind, giving us a conscience and imbuing us with his characteristics, which include righteousness and justice. They're inside us. These are what Abraham was told to teach his children and his household after him. Notice it says children, not just Isaac. Here is a pattern for fathers to follow throughout the generations. Yet how many fathers teach their children about doing righteousness and justice? Verse 19 ends with, so that yud he vav he the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he promised him. All nations would bless themselves through him. Wow, what Abraham promised would be available to every nation on this planet. They too could take an active part in receiving those blessings. How? By just and righteous behavior and trusting in Abraham's God. Genesis 22, 17 to 18 repeats this promise. I will bless you and I will multiply your seed and your seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. Hallelujah. And in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. This was after Abraham passed that unbelievably tremendous test of his faith where God told him to sacrifice his unique son, Isaac. God is showing us that it is not because of our faith alone. We've all been given the gift of faith, as Rav Shaul reminded us. Faith is a gift of God so that no one can boast. But. Abraham then put this faith, emunah, his gift, into action by being obedient, turning faith to trust, bitachon. That's the difficult part of this formula. We all have that in our lives, and it is not easy. But obedience is a key element in the Torah. But obedience to whom? And to what is vital? We have all been given the right and the honor of asking the Boreo Lam, our creator, to help us through every tough situation where we are not trusting him. I know it's hard because our God is invisible. But although we cannot see him with the naked eye, we know he does exist within the ether, within our thoughts which, by the way, are also invisible, but are very real. And he makes himself known to us in a myriad of ways, if we pay attention. Now, here's another formula, which I gleaned from Bereshit 20, verse 17, where it says, And Abraham prayed to God and healed Abimelech, his wife. No, Abimelech, his wife, and his maidservant, and they bore children. For the Lord had closed tight all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. Now, hopefully everybody read that story, so I won't go into repeat it again. But if you haven't, I do recommend that go and read it. Because the key element is right here. God opened the wombs of all these women as he did with Sarah at the age of 89, and every other barren woman mentioned in the Tanakh. There's so many of them. Rachel, Rebecca, Leah, um, um, Hannah. God opens and closes wombs for a reason. He always has a purpose. He's demonstrating a clear pattern here for how God works. And he always stays true to it. When God performs a miracle, he generally uses something that he's already created to fulfill it. He doesn't need to create something new. So this brought to my mind 
another special son, born to another mother of Israel during the Roman occupation. If we say that God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, why would we suddenly believe that God would do a new thing with Miriam, the mother of Yeshua? Why should we allow a culture filled, replete with Greek and Roman mythology and a foreign religion so unfamiliar with the Torah and our Boreolam to dictate to us how our rabbi and anointed prophet Yeshua would be born? There are many myths about Yeshua's birth, and this happened years after he and all his followers had died. For example, one such myth came from a church father, a church leader named Origen of Alexandria. He lived between 189 to 254 in the Common Era. He stated that Mary gave birth to Jesus out of an affair with Tiberius Pantera, a Roman soldier. And this idea was reinforced in the Talmud and ancient Jewish writings where he was named Yeshua ben, no, Yeshu, Ben Pantera, a great example of fake news. Consider the following scenario about Yeshua's birth, which is far more in line with the Hebrew understanding of that day. Now, I'm taking this from an article written by Rabino Yosef Shemi in Argentina in collaboration with our own rabbi, Netanel Ben Yochanan. The parents of Yeshua. Miriam and Joseph would have been in their early teens. He was not an old man, that was told. They were both in their early teens, which is according to tradition. They were engaged through shiduch. They used a matchmaker. It was a shatchan, who was a shatchan. A matchmaker is a shatchan. There are two parts of the Jewish marriage ceremony. The first is the erusim, the betrothal. And the second is the nisuim, the actual wedding. So the engaged couple were already considered married. This is important. If that's the case, we know how teenagers' hormones can race. So would it be possible that some hanky-panky took place before the wedding and Miriam became pregnant. Certainly happens today. But what would make this a miraculous birth? Like all the mothers of Israel before her, whose womb needed to be open, so did Miriam's. We have a prophecy in Isaiah 7, 14, which says a young woman, in Hebrew, Alma, would conceive and bear a son. Many of us take this as a, a, a messianic prophecy. There are three words in Hebrew which all mean virgin, but they have different understandings, while the Greek has only one word to cover all three. The three Hebrew words for virgin are Alma, Betula, and Naara. Now, Alma refers to a virgin or a young girl before she had her period. She was unable to conceive. The betula refers to a virgin who already has her period. She's able to become pregnant, but specifically points to a woman of any age who either hasn't had sexual relations or whose womb was never opened by childbearing like Sarah. Na'ara is used to specifically describe a teenager who is still a virgin, but she has her period and is physically able to become married, uh, sorry, pregnant. Miriam was an Alma who hadn't had her period yet. God opened her womb because he had a special role, a special purpose for Yeshua. Here's something else to think about. The early church fathers had already created their doctrine of the three persons of the Trinity, 
the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, three gods in one. One of the Ten Commandments states, you shall not commit adultery. Logic dictates that if the person of the Holy Spirit is the one who impregnated Mary, wouldn't he be causing her to commit adultery? These ideas simply do not line up with the Torah. That is our basis by which to um, every truth needs to be compared to the Torah, so-called truth. Why is this important? Yeshua is a son of Israel. His role was unique, as were the roles of his ancestors, Abraham and Moses. He stated his purpose clearly to the people of Israel in Matthew, in Matityahu 5.17. Don't misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the Torah written by Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. And what was that purpose? He would continue the work of Abraham the work of Moses and our prophets, whose desire it was to bring our people back to the God of the written Torah, which is not the same as the oral Torah. Why? So that we, his chosen ones, would be or legoyim, light to all the nations of the world and fulfill this promise by God to Abraham. Similar to the time of the Roman occupation, corruption was, is rampant at all levels of society today. Our world is in chaos, and very few are like Abraham, who call upon the name of the Lord, and who live with righteousness and justice. This is at the root of what is happening in our world today. My people are weeping because our families are being murdered by terrorists. We are marching in rallies for Israel, begging for the release of the captives, living in fear and dread as this terror is spreading to the entire world. We're asking ourselves, just a short 77 years after Hitler, how can this be happening again? And it seems that our nature hasn't changed since Cain and Abel. Two brothers. Cain was so jealous of Abel that he murdered him. Now Israel can and must defend itself. In fact, the name of our army is IDF, Israel Defense Force, the only army in the world. The first thing that God did when he formed us as a nation was to form our army. But the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of us. We fought with God on our side. If we went without him, we lost the battle. God said, it is not by might. It is not by spirit, by strength, but by my spirit. God will always be at our side. But a relationship is two ways. As we read in this parasha, the God of Abraham wants his people to be like Abraham wholehearted, obedient, and to live righteous and just lives. The Torah teaches us how to do that. God is not asking us to become religious fanatics with rules that choke us. We need to be known by him. This is an intimate relationship. When we are intimate with someone, we hide nothing from them. We love and are loyal to them. Let us not provoke our God, the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, by continuing to follow false gods, the God of money, the Egel Zahab, the golden calf, by mimicking the, the ways of the nations in which we live. But like Abraham, let's leave these behind and let's teach our children, fathers and mothers, let's teach our children to live righteous and just lives, 
not by what we say, but by what we do. Let us return to the Boreolam. Let's do what Abraham did and call upon yud heh vav -Heh, the Creator. There is only one race on this earth, the human race, and we are all related. We are all connected at the spiritual level. There's only one God for Jew and non-Jew. There is only one Torah, one set of life-giving principles for Jew and non-Jew. The man-made religions of this world form their own gods and their own real rules, which only serve to lead us away from Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Shabbat Shalom.